Uh, next, we have the opportunity to hear directly from the mayor of the city of Danbury as he provides our community with a year in review along with projects and initiatives that are on the horizon. And ladies and gentlemen, it is my true honor and sincere pleasure to welcome to the podium the star of the Danbury Music Center's Nutcracker Ballet who will be reprising his role as Mother Ginger this evening and Sunday's matinee to deliver his 18th consecutive State of the City address along with serving mayor in the city of Danbury history, Mark D. Fountain. Thank you uh, much, PJ. It's my honor and privilege to be here again uh, today um, with this wonderful Amber Room staff and the great work that they do each and every day. I'd say that this is the first time I've been here, but like many of you out there, I have kind of make a living here. In fact, I've got a small bedroom in the back. Um, breakfast is always exceptional, but I'm a big fan of the prime rib dinner. So, uh, but PJ is absolutely right. Tonight I'll be reprising my role as Mother Ginger. Please don't come and take any pictures and put them up on Facebook or Instagram. It's weird, and um, I've been trying to get out of it for years, but it is for a charity for... Uh, do you hear that, Al? No pictures on Facebook of Mother Ginger. You got um, for charity for the Music Center, and of course, uh, that event is about the kids, right? It's all about uh, making sure the kids have an experience that they'll never forget. So I want to thank all of you for coming here uh, today. We appreciate it. Uh, this is by far, it's got to be one of the largest crowds I've seen for the annual uh, Cecil J. Previty Awards luncheon. Uh, PJ got rid of the head table. I like that. Good move. Um, definitely is, uh, feels a lot uh, more relaxed here. And uh, of course, um, we appreciate all the work the Chamber does each and every year. I want to congratulate George Mulvaney, and of course his business, Mulvaney Mechanical, as a recipient of the Cecil J. Previty Award uh, today. You know, as mayor of the city of Danbury, I've been proud to see George, and I've known him way before I was mayor, watch his business flourish in the Danbury, in the greater Danbury area. And the great thing about George is he's not only a successful businessman, He's proven how to navigate his way through a very difficult business environment here in the state of Connecticut. But he's also a very proud and dedicated corporate partner. He will step to the plate for anyone, anywhere, anytime to lend a hand if they need it. And he does it quietly and effectively in a very compassionate way. So giving him this award today is the right thing to do. And George, I just want to thank you and your family uh, for all the great things you've done for our city. Job well done, my friend. So this is the 18th time that I've come here today to talk a little bit about the state of the city. And as I've mentioned many times before, I always talk about how we're on a mission, you know, to sort of recreate and redefine uh, what government is all about. Uh, I always call it with the staff a crusade, if you will. And our community continues to evolve and to change. It's part of our natural being of the evolution of a city. There's always something different happening. There's always different ideas and thoughts and groups. And so it's important as we reflect back on the last year, we think about the fact that this community of ours, this beautiful 44 square miles that each of us live in and those who border our community, are all part of a much greater evolution as we navigate our way through this next decade. But before I talk a little bit about what I think we should be doing, or will be doing, or what are some of our plans are, I want to share a minute with you about some of the stuff, some of the great things that have happened here in Danbury over the last year. Now, I always like to say it's all about me.com, I'm the one that did all this, but the reality is it's this chamber that did this. This chamber is one of the best chambers in the state of Connecticut. This chamber grows more jobs by accident in one day than the state of Connecticut does all year in trying. That's what this chamber does. And by every vital measurement and statistic, Danbury leads the state. We are the shining star, and you'll hear me say that more than once this, this afternoon. Through October, our unemployment rate is the lowest in any labor market in the state of Connecticut. It is 2.9%. And if you're out there trying to hire people, you know that it's been difficult. 
finding qualified staff to fill uh, your employment needs. That's because we are very close to being fully employed. Over the last 18 months, 1,470 small and medium-sized businesses have registered to do business here in the city of Amherst. Think about that for a second. 1,470 people have decided to take that step towards the American dream, to risk everything and put it all on the line by starting a business. That's an incredible testament to what we do here in our great city. PJ and Joanne Cueva and myself and Anthony Rizzo Jr., we go to dozens of ribbon cuttings every month, big and small, for various corporations. And of course, we also go to a lot of groundbreakings that go along with it. And I'll just give you a couple of quick examples, otherwise you'd be here pretty much all day with me reading the list. But uh, this, this year we broke ground on a new assisted living facility called Keystone on Wor Worcester Heights. We cut the ribbon at Coyote Restaurant on Mill Plain Road. I cut the ribbon at Owl Cyber Defense's new headquarters on Old Ridgeberry Road. I cut the ribbon on Selmer's Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine Center at 40 Old Ridgeberry Road. I cut the ribbon at Doc's Medical Group on North Main Street, an urgent care facility. I cut the ribbon on a new pediatric unit at the Danbury Hospital. I cut the ribbon on Connecticut Special Care Center on Newtown Road. I cut the ribbon on Pure Physique on Kenosha Avenue. I cut the ribbon on Extreme Cheer on a Mill Plain Road. I cut the ribbon on Duluth Training Center in the Marcus Derry Plaza and in a small store called Lunestra on Main Street. And of course, most importantly for 2020, because this city knows how to eat, we're going to cut the ribbon on the Shake Shack and Longhorn Steakhouse, because we have our priorities straight. As always, Main Street is a focus of our economic being. And I've got some thoughts on that that I'll share a little bit later, but I do want to point out that we have spent a lot of resources, time, and energy through Sharon Calitro and our planning department to be able to foster an environment downtown that is conducive to sustainable economic development. You see, we shouldn't rise and fall every time a store opens and closes on Main Street. Those are the forces of the marketplace that happen. And really what we should be doing, and as City Center is, is fixed on doing, and rightly so, is creating a backbone for those individual stores that start their business, to be able to encourage them and not discourage them in terms of what they do each and every day. Just last week, this chamber, this chamber planted a stake in our downtown by relocating its office to 1 Ive Street. By the way, this is a new facility that reflects the success of our business community. It's a beautiful uh, site on the third floor. You should visit it and have a tour of it because it really does make a statement about how we value business in Danbury. And to that end, we've also sponsored additional art projects through the Main Street Corridor, and of course we've begun to undertake the downtown Danbury Streetscape Renaissance Project. The project, like the public art initiative I just mentioned, has been one of the recommendations of the recently completed uh, downtown Danbury transit-oriented development study. Last year, in the past year, the city was awarded its second grant from the state of Connecticut. It's part of the Responsible Growth and Transit-Oriented Development Program. Two million more dollars, which will supplement 1.6 million dollars in existing city funding to allocate to use to reconstruct our downtown sidewalks and streetscape infrastructure. Today, I'm announcing in a few minutes a new bond package that will run on April the 28th, the date of the presidential preference primary. And in that bond package, I'm going to include $9 million more dollars to do every single sidewalk on both our main arterial as well as all of the off-shoot streets up and down Main Street to, to embrace things like bike paths and complete streets programming and to be able to make it a more walkable, accessible downtown. Safety and security. Safety and security in our downtown have been a focus. Now, I'm going to say this later in the speech, but I'm going to tell you right now. Major crime in Danbury is down 20% year over year this year. 20%. This year we deployed three officers in a rotating shift in our downtown from May to September. It was a trial, a beta test, if you will. We need to do some more massaging on it, but it's the right look for downtown. 
you don't necessarily need an officer at every 10 feet, but you do every once in a while feel, take comfort in being able to see a public safety officer somewhere up and down uh, the sidewalk. Chief Ridenour has led this effort. Chief Ridenour has expanded our community policing effort. Chief Ridenour has spent his time working with our command staff and our patrol division to make them the very best that they can be. And so, Chief, I want to thank you for those statistics and the hard work that you've done. Please stand and be recognized. Now, I don't want to make Chief Wheel upset, because we love our fire department. And what Chief Wheel has done is taken our fire department and changed its mission. Of course, we put out fires, and of course, we get the cat out of the tree by putting the food on the ground. We never deploy the ladder, right? Uh, but in terms of that, we have become a full-service wraparound agency, if you will, to solve problems for people. If you got a problem, our paid department and our volunteer department can figure out how to solve it. Whether you locked your keys out of the car at the mall or whether you locked yourself out of, out of your house, these men and women do a phenomenal job for us every day. It's part of the added value that we bring to city government each and every day. So thank you, Chief Wheel, and you stand to be recognized as well. As we speak, the News Times building on Main Street is in the process of being demolished. It'll be turned into market rate apartments. These 150 or so units will have important amenities like a pool, a rooftop pool, a workout center, and it will be connected to the Crosby Street apartments as well via a pedestrian bridge. They'll complement the already 400 odd units at Kennedy Flats. And for a second, let's reflect on Kennedy Flats. 96% full. 96% full. I remember when people laughed at us and said, nobody will live downtown. Their wait time now is to May and June. We've also faced a challenge this year in education. I know that Dr. Pascarella is with us, and uh, I have a lot of respect for Dr. Sell. We spent a lot of time on the phone, probably three or four times a week, maybe more particularly at 4 a.m. when deciding whether or not to cancel school or leave school open or delay school, which I don't have a say in anyways, but the kids always think I do, so I kind of own the whole thing. But let me just tell you something about Dr. Sell. He maximizes every single dollar that the city council sends to his division, to the Board of Education. Every single dollar. And let me also tell you that every single dollar we get from the state of Connecticut for education goes to education. And with that, last year Dr. Sale had seven schools of distinction. Seven schools that are distinction. The only other community that had the same was Greenwich, Connecticut, that spends about $8,000 more per kid. So Dr. Sale, take a round of applause. This past year we completed drainage and paving improvements. We encouraged and, and kept our partnership with the state of Connecticut as we have a very expansive study of the Route 84 corridor and, look, and I would look for uh, an expansion program put in place shortly uh, by the governor. And speaking of the state of Connecticut, they have finally begun work here at the Route 37 Stacy Road project. A little delayed, but they got it figured out and they're back doing what they need to do. About an hour or so ago, I completed a Skype call with the Metropolitan Area Planning Forum in New York City to expand on and discuss our recently approved feasibility study of the Danbury to Southeast train connection. The objective was to share with them how excited this chamber is, our community is, as well as the state is, about linking up our downtown railroad station to Southeast and the Harlem Line. I shared with our New York friends the support and encouragement that we have from our local elected officials on a bipartisan basis, our state elected officials on a bipartisan basis, and from the commissioner of DOT, Joe Gelati. I want to also give special thanks to Mary Ellen O'Dell, the Putnam County Executive. She's been a champion of this project and has worked tirelessly to see it done. Understand how important this project is. Understand what happens to your property value should we be able to connect the Danbury Rail Station in downtown to southeast. Understand the impact of a thousand commuters parking every day downtown 
coming back from work and wanting to get a bite to eat or go to a store or be able to find a place to hang out. It will be a game changer in terms of what happens in our city. It will also help us in getting cars off of I-84. The I-84 corridor study done by the state shows that 70% of all those cars you see at 4 o'clock in the evening at exit 2 and exit 1 and then out to Mill Plain Road and then right down West Street, right by my office, 70% of those cars are commuters heading in or coming from Westchester, White Plains, and New York City. If we can get a portion of those people into the train and out of the cars, that will alleviate that choke point on 84. Work is on the public improvement side. Work is ongoing at the Octagon House on Spring Street. We have a plan. We're going to execute our plan in terms of developing that building. Bids are being completed. Bid specifications for the Terry Wild Castle. It only took us three years to understand and convince the state through two administrations that we were able to clean this in a way that is economically and environmentally friendly as well as safe for our workers. So we'll be able to start that. Richter Hart, Richter, excuse me, Richter House is in the same boat. Uh, they will be bid shortly. I want to thank uh, Representative Arcani for his tireless effort at getting us a million dollar grant from the state that we'll be able to deploy along with money that we've been able to uh, get. So thank you, David. We we'll see you over there. Cleaning his clubs, getting ready for the spring, I bet. But anyways, I also am proud to announce this morning we received word that the Women's Center Project which is the old Mallory Hat factory site, highly contaminated, has been green-lighted for cleanup by the city of Danbury. So we'll be awarding that bid shortly, and we'll be building a road into that project. And of course, uh, that will mean uh, that Pat Zachman now has her work to do in terms of getting that building for us. But this will be a tremendous asset for our downtown, so thank you, Women's Center, for working cooperatively with us. John Priol is here. And John built us a brand new driving range out at Richter Park, which has been very successful. Uh, I was proud to hit, I was supposed to be the first tee shot off the new driving range, but it really was like the 700th. But that's okay, because I did hit it straight down the middle, and I got a nice round of applause. Um, but it's been successful. And all of the basketball courts at Richter Park have been rebuilt, as well as the tennis courts. And I want to just thank the Public Works Division, the Public Works Division, and the uh, Public Buildings Division, Every single tennis court in this city has been refurbished to a 20-year lifespan. Everyone, high school, Rogers Park, as well as Richter Park. And I think that's a tremendous accomplishment. Over 20 roads have been repaved, rebuilt, and we have planned for even more this year. Three new bridges are in the process of being replaced over the next several months. Our waste treatment plant is finally, a uh, bid has been awarded. Now, I know this is really boring to you, but I get excited about stuff like waste, and I know I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to because next election is not for two years. It may be crap to you, but it's money to us, so it's important, <laughs> all right? Anyways, we programmed that project out at about $120 million. We've just awarded that bid for $74 million. And I want to thank Antonio Hydrola and David Day for driving the cost of that project down. And what's great about this is that it's a sustainable project. We're going to produce diesel fuel out of the output that comes out of your home to power all of our heavy equipment, which will save us hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. <laughs> Sean Hardy is here from our permit department. Sean has just implemented a cloud permitting program. We've rolled it out. We've met with our stakeholders. We are now allowing people to get permits from their home for a variety of different programs and, and projects, as well as come in and have a minimal impact. Not that we don't love our people at the window. We do, but be able to speed things along because we know that permits and quick access to permits is money, and we want to make that as possible, as fast as possible. Earlier, I had mentioned uh, that I'll be proposing a bond package for April. I'll go to the city council with that in January. And our infrastructure bond we've been working on for about a year. It's a combination of work from Sharon Calitro, Antonio Idrola, David St. Hilaire, and a whole bunch of people. We're calling this bond issuance plan SNAP 2020. SNAP 2020. It focuses on creating more school space for our students, repairing some of our neighborhoods and our sidewalks, adding to our parks and to our 
public spaces, and of course making our city energy efficient by going green. In SNAP 2020, I'm proposing that we program $18 million to continue our paving program, for more drainage work, and to replace and repair three more bridges. In addition, as I mentioned, I'm proposing that the voters agree to fund $9 million, which will be the final phase of all sidewalks in the Main Street Corridor. If approved by the voters by the end of 2021, as I mentioned earlier, all of our sidewalks will have been completed from North Street all the way down to Rogers Park. I've also included $7 million for park improvements in our public spaces. These are things like basketball courts, repair and replace facilities at Candlewood Town Park, and of course acquire more open space for passive recreation uses. Money in the section of the proposed bond will also be programmed to develop a river walk along the Still River on Crosby Street that will have an art component to it and will encourage pedestrian and bicycle traffic exercise in our downtown. As I mentioned, we have a Go Green component to it as well. We're spending about $2 million in energy efficient projects in our schools and our city buildings. All of these projects are self-funded and they have a very, very short payback period. And ultimately, this will save us millions of dollars. And as I mentioned earlier, it's no secret that we're facing an unprecedented increase in enrollment in our public schools. It's been well documented. Most of the student growth we are seeing is from our downtown area. And that's why I'm asking the voters to approve $21 million to renovate our downtown Osborne Street Resource Center into a flexible classroom space that the Board of Education can use to help manage short-term growth issues. Our task force will work on this plus long-term solutions to our space concerns with our city schools. Now look, I know this is somewhat controversial in some ways. But we need to take a serious look at the Danbury Prospect School proposal. We need to take a serious look at what would be a public school for public school children that is a nonprofit that can offer an exceptional academic experience. That business plan makes almost a zero cost to our taxpayers. And that, of course, will solve our space issues by taking 776 students into the program. We have to have that conversation. The game has changed. We've had 550 students show up this year, and Dr. Sell and I are looking at each other saying, what happens if we get 550 more next year? And so we've got to make sure that we're ready, and that means everybody, everything should be on the table, particularly when it comes to having an exceptional academic experience. This school doesn't operate in a vacuum. It's managed by a board of Danbury residents and and has a charter from the state of Connecticut saying that you're absolutely licensed to educate our children. Bricks and mortar are, of course, an important part of delivering critical education services, but the city of Denver needs to help in terms, needs help in terms of operational dollars as well. I know I mentioned Representative Arcani, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, so please don't take this the wrong way. But we need help from the state of Connecticut. Much has been made about us being, quote, last and per people expenditure. That is not the fault of the Danbury taxpayer. The Danbury tax taxpayer spends 80% 80, 80 of our school budget comes from the Danbury taxpayer. The state of Connecticut gives us about 20%. The state of Connecticut has promised us 50%. So what does that mean in real dollars? It means we get shorted about $35 million every year. Every year. So our legislators have got to go to work. They've got to take this seriously. They've got to understand that while we're thankful for $2 million each year, it doesn't match up to enrollment. And it's certainly not sustainable for us if we don't are not able to tap into what is our fair share. But I'm not just going to yell and scream and hold my breath. Of course I'm going to work with our legislators. They're good people that work hard. And they've done a fine job for us. So we'll make sure together, as a team, that we can access the resources we need to access for our kids. And in terms of our growing student population, as I mentioned earlier, most of it is centered in the downtown corridor. Now, I think that's a good thing, because on a recent survey done by Data Haven, 83% of the people that live in Damory say they like living in Damory. 83%. You can't find 83% of people who agree on anything. 
except they like being here. So the fact that we are growing and we're growing in areas where we hadn't grown before is a good thing. We ought to embrace it and be proud of it. Think about this. 90 people leave Connecticut a day. 90 people pack up their car and say, I'm out of here. That's not the case here in our city. People are coming in every single day to be part of this renaissance of our community. So let's wear that as a source of pride. A city in Connecticut where people actually want to live. Unheard of. Yet you all have done that. You know, last year I announced that the new Matrix building was going to be rebranded and has new owners. The owners of the building have now called it the Summit and have been busy recruiting businesses, offices, restaurants, all kinds of stuff into their building. It's a classic repurposing mission. They even have agreed to put a police substation in their building to provide additional security as well. And on top of that, they've agreed to a tax fixing agreement that provides 550,000 additional dollars beyond their taxes to the Danbury Public School System. Unheard of, unprecedented in the state of Connecticut. And by 2038, that number escalates to $750,000 per year for Danbury students. So I want to thank Mike Basile, he's here. Felix is out hunting, I told him not to hurt anything. Um, but we appreciate you guys stepping to the plate for us. <laughs> Two other quick things about our plans for this year. We've been meeting extensively with the Congregational Church across from City Hall. If you haven't been in there, it's a great facility. You should take a look at it. It has seating for 800 people. This is an iconic building in our city. And the congregation wants to preserve the building, and so does the city of Danbury. So, we are going to accept a donation from the Congregational Church of the building. We have then lined up a large and substantial donation from a local philanthropist that will install some of the best acoustics in the state of Connecticut and donate a significant amount of resources for the, for the capital improvements to the building that need to be made. This new building will be rebranded as the Meeting House. The Meeting House will seat, as I mentioned, 800 people, and of course we'll have free parking in the City Hall parking lot. It'll be a beautiful venue dedicated to musical performances, lectures, public activities, debates, holiday events. The Meeting House will preserve forever as an iconic building along Deer Hill Avenue, and it will serve the Ambarians as a focal point for the arts and culture for generations. <laughs> Now, over the last several years, we've acquired a lot of buildings. And I think it's time that we created something called the Historic Preservation Trust. I have a same philanthropist that's willing to donate a significant amount of money to this trust for an investment income to help finance the maintenance of buildings like Terrawild Mansion, Richter House, the Meeting House, as I mentioned, the Railroad Station, and of course, all of the assets of the Danbury Museum and Historical Society. Preserving our past is a way to see our future. It's been a hallmark of my administration. And as a history teacher, I want to be sure that our children and their children know what Danbury is all about. And finally, I talked a little bit about Main Street, but I want to just share a couple of quick thoughts. People have spent a lot of time sometimes, beating up on Main Street, and I disagree. I don't think there's anybody more qualified better to talk about Main Street than me. I live there. I got my dog there. I walk every morning and every night. And so, we have done a wonderful amount of work there. The Pershing Building, and I see Joe DeSilva sitting over there, was vacant for probably 35 years until they moved Naugatuck Valley Community College there. And that building has been brought to life again. And as our backstop, City Center has been working very hard. But I think we also need to engage the business owners from North Street to Memorial Drive, Rogers Park. We ought to have a downtown merchants association, a place where business owners, houses of worship, nonprofits, will become stakeholders of what happens on Main Street, that they'll care, that they'll take pride. Because when we spend $15 million on sidewalks, what good is it 
But the people doing business there don't really care about the fact that we've done this. And don't take ownership of it. Ownership of it. So we'll work closely with City Center and with the Chamber to set up that organization to meet with those people that actually run a business and say, we need you to do more. We need you to clean up in front of your store. We need you to pick up the gum off of the brand new sidewalk we just installed. We need you to take pride because if you want to do more business, you can do more business if people are comfortable walking into your facility. And they also can be a great resource for thoughts and ideas about how to improve what happens along our corridor. You know, we've got great momentum downtown. A Main Street Arts Festival for next June, which is outstanding and I highly recommend going to. Bob Patello sitting over there, hosted one of the best car shows, although I didn't win an award for my Mustang, there's an issue with that. But he hosted one of the best car shows I've seen. We had over 800 vehicles and thousands of spectators and raised a ton of money for the War Memorial. We now have one professional hockey team. We have two professional hockey teams now operating downtown, men and women. We've got a new owner of the Danbury Arena. We've got a San Gennaro Festival, a new festival being planned for September. We've got a great block party that City Center runs, and we have so much more happening there. Take advantage of it. You know, ladies and gentlemen, as we close out the year, I just gotta tell you, uh, I love my job. I love working with you. I am excited and motivated every day I wake up and go to work. I never set out to be the longest serving mayor. It wasn't something I planned to do. But I did want to make a difference in the place that I love, the place that has treated me so well. I take pride in Danbury, and I take pride in Danbury's people. And some nights, like last night, when it's late, it's about 10.30 or so, and I'm leaving City Hall for after a long day, I'll take a pause and look at that row of mayors up and down outside of the City Council chambers. And occasionally a tear will slip out of me as I look at my father's picture. Because I know how proud my parents would have been to see me here today. And during the holiday season, we think of those people that are not with us anymore a lot, don't we? We reflect on them, we pray for them, and we hope that they can somehow feel us enjoying these times. And I know wherever my parents are, that they're proud of me. So let me finish by telling you what I'm proud of. I'm proud of a triple A community that s and says has very strong management with strong financial policies and practices. I'm proud of a school district that gets it done every day and delivers a quality educational experience for our children. I'm proud of the job our Danbury Police Department and all of our public safety components do for our city. I'm proud of our Main Street and the work that goes on down there. I'm proud that Danbury is blessed with so many great assets, a first-rate hospital, a world-class university, a vibrant arts community, an economy that is the shining star of the state of Connecticut. Those are metrics, those are high scores and high rankings that are because of the people here in this room. I'm proud that Danbury and the greater Danbury area is a great place to live, to work, and to be educated in. And as we stand here today on the cusp of the new decade, as I said before, I'm so very proud to be your mayor. During this holiday season, take a moment to be thankful where you are. It's always the journey and never the destination. Be thankful for the young people in our armed forces around the globe. Be proud of this America that we live in. Take a moment and think about our loved ones, the kind of people that I had in my life who I know will have a chuckle wherever they are, that their son, who drove, the, who drove the Danbury High School staff absolutely crazy when I was a student there, just won my 10th term as mayor of the city of Danbury. So be thankful. And be thankful for your health. Be thankful for your family. My friends, that is the state of our city in the year of 2019. May God bless you, and may God bless America. Merry Christmas, everybody.